He excelled at sports, built for battle. Jesse Matthew had the physical physique of a quintessential American football player. Large enough to be offered to play at the college level. When his college football days were over, Jesse stayed strong, popular in his hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia. You know, he was from this community. He played football in our local high school. He helped coach football in one of our private schools in Charlottesville. He was frequently seen figure on our downtown pedestrian mall. His first victim was 21-year-old student Morgan Harrington, abducted on a prestigious college campus. Eventually, Morgan would be found dead. Five years later, Jesse Matthew snatched a second student, Hannah Graham, from the same university town. We were against an apex predator who was comfortable abducting, raping, and murdering a girl. Detectives gather evidence until a picture of a suspect emerges. Which piece of the jigsaw puzzle will reveal Jesse Matthew? What would be the killer's mistake? It would have been really fun seeing how she turned out. I'm Morgan Harrington's mom. Uh, Morgan's not here anymore because she was abducted and murdered in 2009. Who would think our precious little Morgan would interface with a serial murderer in a nice town like Charlottesville, Virginia and be taken down? Um, but that is indeed what happened. Charlottesville, a nice little college town. It was college towns that the serial murderer who had snatched Jill Harrington's daughter preferred when preying on his victims. In 2009, Morgan went to see one of her favorite bands at the John Paul Jones Arena on the campus at the University of Virginia, Metallica. Her father is Dr. Dan Harrington. She had wanted to be at that concert uh, for about six months before, they, uh, before the concert occurred. She went to go to the concert. I, I always have believed in leave taking. I don't just sit on the couch and say, bye bye. I get up and go see them out. And she got in her car and, you know, put down her mirror, fixed her lipstick, and leaned out and said, 241, Mama. 241, a Harrington family saying. 241, I love you too much, forever, and once beyond forever. Morgan, a student at Virginia Tech, two hours' drive from the UVA campus, set off. She arrived to meet friends before heading to the concert. When inside, she had an accident. Witnesses would later describe to her family and friends what had happened. We saw her fall on the way to the bathroom. You know, it's a concert and the lights are crazy and she hit her head. So by the time she got to the bathroom, she was bleeding from an open gash and she went outside in the cold and she walked around for 45 minutes. There's a rule at the John Paul Jones, no readmittance once you've left. Morgan was spotted, unsteady on her feet, outside the arena. As she began to feel stronger, Morgan messaged her friends, saying that she'd make it back to where she was staying in the student town. So she called a cab company. When she was picked up in the cab, she's going to her destination, and she realizes that she doesn't have enough money for the fare. She almost has enough, but she just doesn't quite have the full fare. The taxi driver is believed by several detectives to have offered Morgan a free ride home in exchange for some sort of sex act. Morgan is so offended, she jumps out of the cab wants to be so far away from this person that she literally leaves that cab running. Morgan's friends returned from the concert expecting to see her, but she was not where they'd agreed to meet, and she wasn't returning their calls. Morgan is quickly reported as missing. The next day, a search of the campus turns up a troubling discovery. And on October 18th, a lacrosse player found 
the ID about Morgan. On a bridge, on a walkway, something was wrong. We got the call that Morgan Purse had been found outside John Paul Jones Arena. And I came in, uh, Dan was sitting here, and we were waiting for her. He said, oh, you know, Charlottesville police called, they found Morgan's purse. And that was like the elevator plummeted because you knew. If her purse was gone, she would have been on the phone crying. She w it, we would have heard from her. So I said, where, where is she? Nobody knew in those early days that Morgan had tried to get a taxi ride home, so nobody suspected a cab driver in her disappearance, which was a mystery. She was officially designated missing. The Harringtons would have to wait 101 days for more news about Morgan. Morgan Harrington has hundreds of waves to jump at the beach in the Outer Banks. Help us bring her back. We brought in uh, external people to uh, search for Morgan. We had 2,000 people in Charlottesville who were searching for her. How do you speak about someone who is missing? I, I don't even like the word. It's not descriptive. You know, my, my reading glasses are missing because I'm careless with them. We were not careless with our daughter. She was stolen from us. The search in the weeks after Morgan disappeared was fruitless. Life got back to normal in Charlottesville. Nobody suspected 27-year-old Jesse Matthew, who was working as a cab driver in Charlottesville. He'd returned to his hometown after five years away. Morgan's life thus far had been one of middle-class surroundings, comfortable home. What of Jesse Matthew? He came from a devout Christian family in Charlottesville. His mother, concerned at his adolescent behavior, had moved him from the town to live nearby, but surrounded by Virginia farms, and not the temptations of drugs and crime in the city. He lived in what's called the North Garden area of Charlottesville, and maybe hunted on the farm. It's important to remember that detail. Matthew knew the farms and fields which would one day be scoured for evidence of the missing Morgan Harrington. Once out of the town, young Jesse started to progress at school. Not academic, but big and successful at sports. He went to high school in Charlottesville. Uh, you know, he was uh, an athlete. Jesse came to understand himself purely in physical, in almost animalistic terms. He was this muscular, physically strong, dominant individual, and that's all he was. If you lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, it was not easy to miss Jesse Matthew. Tim Longo would one day become chief of police in the city. He got to know all about Jesse, the talented American footballer. For the life that Jesse led, size really mattered, and his strength would become a focus of the later investigation. Jesse was a massive figure. He was a large man, and I suspect uh, in, in uh, in those days when he was engaged actively in athletics, he was suspect, I would suspect he was uh, a very intimidating uh, figure on the field, if you will. In 2003, the intimidating football player got a place at university. He didn't last long. Um, he then went to Liberty University on a football scholarship. Um, there was an, uh, an accused rape there that no one prosecuted. Inquiries are made about his relationship with this young lady. He says it's consensual, and he says that he didn't do anything, never forced anything on her, that this was somebody that he had a relationship, and it was consensual on both sides. And then suddenly, Jesse Matthew is gone. The 21-year-old Jesse Matthew had been a suspect, but was not charged. He was asked to leave instead. And the next term, Jesse discovers that there's always room at a college for another football player, and that there are more women to abuse. He went to Christopher Newport. There was a rape there. This is a man who's moving from college to college, committing a series of sexual assaults on women. But this time, the campus, the college, it's all hush-hush. Nobody will talk. And they're not being reported to the police. The colleges are handling them internally. They all rely on privacy laws. They can't disclose the information for the sake and the privacy of the students that may or may not be involved. 
When Jesse Matthew gets rewarded for his sporting prowess, for his physical prowess, I think that he would not have understood the difference between exploiting that prowess on the sports field and explo exploiting that prowess with women to attack and abuse women. On both campuses, it appeared that one student had made a claim about another, Jesse Matthew, who had, in turn, claimed that acts of sex had been consensual. Matthew evades arrest. He is not DNA swabbed. It's no longer a university problem. They're able to perhaps tell that the victim, the student, that the problem has been removed and nothing gets done. There is no thorough, diligent police investigation into the assault of this young lady. There's something about the pattern of offending, the persistence of it and the intensity of it, which suggests to me that this activity is all-consuming for Jesse Matthew. It is who he is, it's who he becomes, it's what his life is about, the pursuit of this quest to satisfy his violent and sexual urges. That is all he is. He shapes his life to facilitate the activity. It fits in with the more important quest meaning to his life, which is the pursuit of these animalistic, predatory urges. Jesse Matthew was a danger to women but was not on the police records for rape, so he was still to yield his DNA to the US national database called CODIS. DNA is the detective's friend. With it, crimes can be more easily linked to an offender. Without it, rapists like Jesse Matthew can go undetected. He was yet to make the mistake of being arrested for a crime which required a DNA swab. So he was free to attack again. In 2005, Jesse Matthew had given up on being a student, but he was working in another university town, Fairfax City, Virginia. There are six college campuses within a 10-mile radius of Fairfax City. Matthew was a regular at university events, which allowed him to prey on undergraduates who assumed themselves safe, but who were not. Brian Harris was a homicide hunter for 20 years. He's been investigating the Jesse Matthew timeline. In September 2005 in Fairfax City, there was yet another sexual assault victim. It is as if he is a wild animal. All he knows, all he is aware of, all he is focused on are his urges. But she was a survivor. And the woman remembers enough to be able to generate an e-fit, so they are able to create a physical likeness of him. And he also leaves behind some DNA. The trouble is DNA is pretty useless unless the person who's left the DNA has been swabbed and placed on the DNA database. As his DNA was not on CODIS, the national database, no link could be made to Jesse Matthew. This was the eFit image and was what detectives had to go on in search of the Fairfax City rapist. Jesse was upset when teased by friends that it looked a little like him. Eventually, they'd all laugh it off. We have him getting upset at being recognised potentially in the photo fit, upset. Um, now that's not a, the kind of emotional reaction that you, you would anticipate for somebody that was able to do the things that he did, for somebody who is so predatory, so, so obsessed with, his, with pursuing his, his sexual and violent urges. He projected a public image of a playful, gentle giant. I guess there's no other way to describe it. He, he, kind of had that image in people's minds, that he is not the kind of person, the kind of spirit that's capable of something this horrific. I think that's what people felt. There are indications that this is not somebody out of touch with human emotion entirely. I mean, you just don't get people defending you if you are devoid of any human emotion, but the psychotic serial killers that we know don't get people standing up in their defense. Opportunity after opportunity to arrest Jesse Matthew for sex crimes had come and gone over a four-year period between 2002 and 2006. In 2007, he was back in Charlottesville working as a cab driver with a job on the side. He played football in our local high school. He helped coach football in one of our private schools in Charlottesville. Uh, he was a, a frequently seen figure 
uh, on our downtown pedestrian mall. He was well known. The journey from schoolboy athlete to college footballer via two campuses before returning to Charlottesville was complete. As the search for Morgan Harrington continued in 2009, nobody knew about his sexual predator past and about the rape in Fairfax City. The evening that Morgan went missing, Jesse Matthew was just the gentle giant who was working the cab shift on the night of the concert at the main UVA campus when Metallica were in town. Detectives would not discover for a long time that Matthew was working the taxi rank nearby. There was something else they were yet to discover. Morgan was looking for a ride. During the same time, Jesse Matthew has suddenly stopped taking cab calls. The cab company describes the night for Jesse as being extremely busy, constant call after call after call. But around 9.30, Jesse stopped answering. They couldn't get a hold of him. This is the exact same time that Morgan went missing. That piece of evidence would remain unknown for another six years. How, after all, would investigators have uncovered it? They would need to request the records to want them. They would have to suspect Jesse Matthew. They didn't. No witnesses had seen him with Morgan. No security cameras had captured the moment that he picked her up in his cab. Three months after being reported missing, a farmer living not far from where Jesse's mum had moved the Matthew family years before, broke the deadlock in the search for Morgan Harrington. Morgan was missing for 101 days before her body was discovered. It's hard to believe this, but having someone find the body is, is a blessing because otherwise they are just forever lost. And so knowing that Morgan was murdered was far less concerning to me than not finding her body. The body was actually a collection of bones. Clothing was also found. That was how police were confident. It was Morgan Harrington. What did show up was her T-shirt, which was a, a Pantera T-shirt that uh, was very unique, that had blood on it. And out of that blood, a DNA match, a DNA profile was developed and that DNA match matched other cases in years past, other sexual assaults that had happened. Specifically, the DNA matched that found on the victim of the Fairfax City rape. Detectives now knew that whoever had killed Morgan had raped the student in 2005. But again, without a cross check on the CODIS database, the identity of the attacker remained unknown. A year passed, still no breakthrough. Metallica helped keep the publicity levels high in the hunt for Morgan's killer. They called Dan uh, two days after Morgan was abducted and said, as fathers, as fathers, we are outraged. How can we help you? Hi, I'm James of Metallica. Back in 2010, our band offered $50,000 to help catch the person responsible for murdering Morgan Harrington. If you've seen the person in this sketch or have any information about this case, please contact your local police or submit your information online. Despite the high profile of the crime, Jesse Matthew was still not a suspect. As the years passed, police and Jill Harrington knew that sexual predators who kill don't stop until they're caught. I was told early in the investigation that it was most likely, most likely, that Morgan's killer would be found from DNA on another body during a press conference. I said, it's too late for Morgan, but please, let's work together and save the next girl. Because I knew we, we were against an apex predator who was comfortable abducting, raping, and murdering a girl, and I didn't want him to get another one. An apex predator is defined as an animal with no superior in its natural habitat, the king of the jungle, unstoppable. Jesse Matthews cannot conceive of not succeeding in this domain. Uh, he always has succeeded when he, he's applied himself physically. Uh, his understanding of women and of, and of uh, how to satisfy his sexual urges are such that the only route open to him is to continue to persist and to use force. And I do feel that there is such a thing as a predator. Predator is just probably the best characterization one could provide. This person is in this town 
He's, in, he's a local boy. This is homegrown talent. He, he is comfortable here, and predators stay where they're comfortable. Matthew, after Morgan's murder, did stay on in Charlottesville. Again, ironically, a year after she had been killed, Matthew was arrested. It would be another near miss in the search for Morgan's killer because he was not asked for his DNA. In 2010, Jesse Matthew is arrested for criminal trespass. It's not an offense where a DNA sample is required. It's a misdemeanor offense. It's like getting a slap on the wrist. So who knows that day that he was arrested for criminal trespass, what Jesse Matthew, what his intent was. Still without Matthew's DNA, there was no forensic evidence to link him to any of the sex crimes. And without witnesses to his attacks or images of him captured on security cameras when on the prowl, he was free to attack again. And that was what the predator planned. Early one morning in 2014, Charlottesville Chief of Police Tim Longo received a call. I was in Texas teaching a class to a group of police officers and I got up one morning and there was a, uh, an email from a mother from Northern Virginia. And I'll paraphrase the email, it basically said, Chief Longo, help find my daughter's friend. I didn't know what she was talking about. I, I had just gotten to Texas. I wasn't aware of what had occurred over the weekend, so I quickly called home to find out that uh, a 19-year-old University of Virginia student uh, had come missing over the weekend. By the end of the day, I had made a decision I needed to come home and meet two people that I would come to know, and uh, John and Susan Graham. The Graham family was British, working and studying in the United States, and their daughter Hannah was the young student who had gone missing. This one particular night, she went out with her friends. She was celebrating. She had a few drinks. She went to one bar and another bar. At the same time, this very same night, Jesse Matthew, he is also out, and he is also bar hopping. There's an ongoing debate about the use of security cameras in towns and cities. Charlottesville has few in public spaces, but it does have a lot of cameras in private spaces like stores on the downtown mall in Charlottesville. Jesse Matthews Knight was about to be captured on camera. His well-known figure would register in the worlds of a lot of witnesses. He went to at least three different bars. At each bar, every bartender, all the employees still remember Jesse Matthew. Why? He was a nuisance. He was hitting on women. He was making inappropriate comments and advances towards numerous women that they complained to the bartenders and the waitresses. Jesse Matthew, what was his reply? That he was out to pick up women. A few streets away, Hannah Graham was figuring out how and where to meet up with friends. Hannah Graham, unbeknownst to her, her path would cross with Jesse Matthew. Her friends had previously offered to give Hannah a ride. She didn't want to be a trouble to anyone, so she said she would walk. But Hannah was confused, she got lost, and even texted that she was disorientated and that she didn't know where she was. She's 19 years old, bright, talented, but 19. You know, I worked very hard in the early stages of this investigation not to allow the image of this sweet young girl to be tarnished because of the decisions that she may have made that night whether it be alcohol or something else. I don't think she deserved that. I don't think her family deserved that. And I worked very hard to make sure that uh, we didn't paint that image. But the reality of it is, she is a 19-year-old girl. And uh, she made her own decisions that night. And uh, I'm not gonna second guess those decisions. She was somewhere around 14th Street. This is where it is believed Jesse Matthew picked her up. Witnesses later said that they heard a woman scream, no, I won't get in that car with you. Hannah never met up with her friends, did not appear the next morning. So that began an investigation that, that day when I met John and Susan Graham that uh, launched what would come to be the largest ground search in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we spent uh, many, many days, uh, first in the city of Charlottesville, which is about 10 square miles. Over a thousand people were involved in the search for Hannah. They scoured numerous areas of town. And then uh, in concentric circles, began moving outward 
uh, into Albemarle County, which is our neighboring uh, jurisdiction, some 700 square miles here. The Beta Bridge is an iconic place at the University of Virginia. Students are encouraged to express themselves by writing on it. Volunteer groups use it as a place to issue rallying cries for helpers. Hannah had been part of one of those groups. At another bridge nearby, her family and those of Morgan Harrington would one day meet. The anniversary of Morgan's um, death occurred during the time that Hannah was missing. And uh, we had, um, as we did every year, had a um, memorial ceremony at the bridge and we had uh, media there and uh, the Grahams were there. The University of Virginia um, was also there. As teams of detectives and volunteers search the woods, fields and farms throughout the county beyond Charlottesville, Chief Longo and his team set about talking to witnesses, combing through what security footage they could find. Thanks to some video surveillance footage that we discovered on our downtown pedestrian mall, where uh, we believe that Hannah was abducted by Mr. Matthew. We were able to discern his image. It was the turning point in the hunt for a killer. All of a sudden, they had pictures of Jesse Matthew. And it was interesting, of course, at that time, he had dreadlocks and a heavier beard. And one morning, I looked at my Facebook, and this woman had messaged me, and she said, I worked with Jesse Matthew, and here is a picture of him from six years ago. When you looked at the, the composite, and they were exact, I, I was stunned. There is a lot of evidence which establishes that Matthew's victims fought for their lives. While this is going on, Jesse Matthew shows up to work with a swollen jaw. Witnesses tell police that actually Matthew has had a swollen jaw, which they think is a bit suspicious. He says it's toothache, but possibly it's a sign that his victim has hit him, and that's, that's the cause of the swelling. This causes people to reflect and think about, could this be the guy? No different than when you think back to Fairfax City and those original composite sketches when Jesse Matthew, his own co-workers, looked at those composite sketches and would tease him, telling him, they look like you. Suspicion of Jesse Matthew was building. The guy with the unmistakable physique was all too clearly walking along the mall with the young woman who'd gone missing. Police now wanted to talk to Jesse Matthew. The way we were able to develop sufficient probable cause to obtain an arrest warrant for him uh, for abduction once the warrant is obtained, when they go inside the apartment. They also check his car. Two vital DNA finds are made, including Hannah's on the passenger side of Matthew's vehicle, proof that she'd been with him, and then a second DNA find. And they recover a pair of shorts, which they later find traces of his DNA and Hannah's as well, which is extremely incriminating. That swab they did on his car door, they also find Hannah's DNA, which places her in his car. He doesn't even try to hide the shorts that have Hannah's DNA on it. Something that many killers would do, would be very aware of doing, uh, but so primitive, so predatory is, is Jesse Matthew that he doesn't, he's not even aware of, he's not considering detection. He's simply focused, like an animal, on the pursuit of his immediate urges. The shorts and other materials are dispatched for analysis. They have a lot of incriminating evidence, but it needs to be processed. It has to go to a lab. But it takes over a week for those results to come back. In the meantime, the detectives have spoken to Jesse Matthew. He has not given his DNA. He has denied any kind of involvement. We were not in a position to detain him at that time. Uh, so he was free to leave, and in fact, he did leave. Matthew decides to get out of town quick. And then he disappears. Just like he disappeared from his two football teams, he's gone and he's in the wind. He, in fact, left the Commonwealth of Virginia. He made his way to, uh, to Texas. Had Jesse Matthew, the killer, made his biggest mistake? The ever-increasing use of surveillance cameras had put him in the frame for abducting Hannah Graham. What had he done with her? The seriousness of the allegations against him would mean officers could now obtain his DNA. Would that finally reveal his crimes? 
Whilst detectives awaited the return of forensic tests, he was on the run in Galveston, Texas. A month after being seen on the downtown Charlottesville Mall with Hannah Graham on the night that she went missing, the runaway Jesse Matthew was caught. On a beach in Galveston, Texas, a woman saw his image, saw his face, and recognized him. And so she called the Galveston Sheriff's Office and she said, I think I know this guy. Matthew was arrested and soon, via video link, being processed for a return to Charlottesville. Are you Jesse Matthew Jr.? No. Mr. Matthew, my name is Judge Henry. You have two charges this morning. You have got a fugitive from justice warrant out of Virginia for abduction of a person with intent to defile. You have got a Galveston County charge of false information to a peace officer. Do you understand that? Those who knew him or of him in his hometown reacted with skepticism. A lot of people in this community would have said to me early on in this investigation, you have got the wrong guy. There's no way in the world that this guy could have committed this offense. He was well known, and there were people who just said, you know, Chief, <laughs> you've, you're barking up the wrong tree. On October 18th, 2014, in a wooded area rarely visited by anyone, and not far from where Jesse Matthews had lived after his move from downtown Charlottesville, the body of a young woman was discovered by one of the search teams. It was about 10 miles out where we discovered the remains of Hannah Graham behind a, a house that actually had been for sale for some period of time. When discovering both the bodies of Morgan and Hannah, detectives and analysts were struck by the unusual ferocity of the attacks. The level of violence that, that Jesse inflicts on these young girls is horrifying. And it's extreme and excessive and unnecessary level of violence. Even in the most horrific of sexual and violent offences, we get some attempt by the offender to relate to the victim in some way or another, to some, even some acknowledgement of their humanity, but we're not getting that at all with Jesse. We're not even getting any acknowledgement of the possibility of being detected. He arrogantly is, is using the same MO. There's fairly strong evidence to suggest that Morgan fought back. When her body finally was recovered, her bones, her skeleton revealed, um, her ribs had been broken, her arms had been fractured. It suggests that she was trying to fight back. There doesn't seem to be any particular um, positioning of the body. His offences uh, and everything that he does within the offences are simply expressions, are extreme expressions of his violent and sexual urges. Detectives considered the evidence. Jesse Matthew is in custody. He has charges, basically kidnapping against him. As each piece of that jigsaw puzzle is flipped over, we're getting that clear portrait, and the portrait is Jesse Matthew. But the investigation's not over. They know who they're looking at. They gotta fill in those pieces. Whilst he was in custody, detectives detailed their case. He was very openly interested in Hannah Graham. That was clear by that video that depicted him walking one way and her walking another. And very quickly thereafter, the image of the two of them together. In the time that he spent with her, brief as it was on the downtown mall, they were seen in a local bar and restaurant. He purchased two drinks, presumably one for himself and, and the other for Hannah and then he was last seen leaving the mall in her company. Having established he was the last person seen with Hannah, investigators now turned to the forensic evidence. First, the shorts found in his bedroom. On those shorts was semen that belonged to Jesse Matthew. Which means they can generate a full profile and match that DNA profile from Jesse Matthew, both to Morgan, to Hannah and to that Fairfax rape all those years ago. To say that it was a breakthrough in the Morgan Harrington investigation would be an understatement. Those puzzle pieces that were flipped out on that table, they're flipping them over. And certainly that forensic evidence not only connected Jesse Matthew to Hannah Graham's death, but uh, to the death of Morgan Harrington and to the violent sexual assault of a, uh, a woman in Fairfax City uh, many years before. They know that Matthew's DNA was on the shirt worn by Morgan Harrington. And when they did eventually recover her shirt, they found some DNA on there, some blood, which possibly came from her assailant, and maybe it came from a scratch or from a, a bite or something. It suggests that she was fighting for her life. Many years had passed 
uh, since Morgan's disappearance and the discovery of her remains. Uh, and frankly, it was a mystery uh, in our community and uh, perhaps across this country as to who was responsible for the death of Morgan Harrington. And to be able to bring that case to closure was a, uh, was a milestone. Would the killer's mistake of being captured on camera lead to his conviction? Virginia is one of 47 states in America which allows defendants to offer a so-called Alford plea. Matthew chose this route when facing charges in Fairfax City. He did not plead guilty, but would not contest the charges of rape against him. I think the evidence against Jesse Matthew had this case went to trial was overwhelming. I got to think that one of the reasons why he took the Alford plea that he did in Fairfax City was there came a point in that trial, I suspect that he realized that the government's evidence against him was more than sufficient to, uh, for a fact finder to return a verdict of guilty. Next came his appearance in court for the murder of Hannah Graham, seen on camera with Jesse Matthew. So they're flipping over each piece and they're getting a clearer picture. And who do they see? That jigsaw puzzle with all those pieces being flipped over is a portrait of Jesse Matthew. The Hannah Graham case was just so clear that they had pictures of him with her. And so immediately it was a death penalty case. But Morgan's case, they had still not charged him with Morgan's death. And so finally, after several months, they charged Jesse with Morgan's death, and, and we went to an arraignment in Charlottesville. Matthew again offered an Alford plea. The big distinction between that plea of guilty in Fairfax City and his guilty plea here in the county of Albemarle was to hear Jesse Matthew say when asked the question, and are you pleading guilty because you are in fact guilty? To hear him say yes, clearly admitting to the murder of these two women was, um, it, it was uh, an incredible moment for their family uh, and, and certainly for this community to hear him accept responsibility for those horrific acts. Jesse Matthew got seven life sentences to be served consecutively, not concurrently. He yielded any chance for parole or geriatric release, any reason for early release, good behavior or whatever that might mean at a supermax prison. He's serving in the far corner of the state in a supermax. It's called Red Onion. It's a fairly notorious, isolated, hardcore prison. I'm told that he spends almost 24 hours a day in his cell, and that may remain the case. In most investigations, a killer is revealed as having made a number of errors, but there's always one which proves pivotal as detectives piece together their case, which was Matthew's mistake. It was to give police enough of a chance to collect his DNA, which he had avoided doing throughout his predatory criminal career. He had escaped being charged after a campus sex attack in 2002, because there had not been enough evidence. And again, in 2003. And you know, in those early cases where he was sexually ass assaulting women, they weren't reported to the police, and so they weren't really investigated. And maybe that's why he thought, I can just do this. No one's reporting me. I can move on. I can offend again. He got greedy. Um, but as his offences escalated and became more serious, so did the resources towards tracking him down. And he was leaving DNA each time. All it then took was for him to slip up, become a person of interest, for the police to take some of his DNA. He essentially got away with attacking women. Um, the endless advances that we know he made alongside these, um, these essentially endorsed, they reinforced the pattern of offending. This is somebody who already had an overinflated sense of self-importance, a sense of invincibility, and there he is, getting away time after time with these attacks on women. It was a dangerous precedent. But he was not invincible. He made mistakes. All of the near misses from justice came home to roost because Matthew forgot the role played by cameras in modern towns and cities. CCTV cameras capture her movements pretty much minute by minute. 
they also capture Jesse Matthew and place him with her. It just made sense that video surveillance technology would be one of many ways in which to provide a safe environment for those who would come and enjoy uh, downtown Charlottesville. And we had been making that plea to, to the local governing body for, for some years. And frankly, there was a lot of resistance, not just by the governing body, but there were some citizens that were uh, resistant against the placement of video cameras, even in a public square. I think it became clear to many people in the aftermath of this, uh, this terrible series of events how important uh, such equipment could be. In no other case, the retrospective investigation of, uh, of, a, of a criminal offense. It was very, very critical piece uh, in this investigation. And it was one that almost certainly saved lives. If Jesse Matthew hadn't been caught, uh, he would have continued offending and the rate of offending would have increased. Um, this is somebody who, this was his life and, and every time he got away with it, it just reinforced his commitment and his belief in the rightness of what he was doing. Jesse Matthews is a predator. I think predators are different stuff, but predators have to pass in the environment where the prey is because that's what they do is they hunt prey. If you look at the footage on the downtown mall when Jesse Matthews saw Hannah Graham, in three strides he went from Fat Albert to Cheetah because he, has to, he had to assume the guys of Fat Albert and, you know, just a big gentle giant. But given the chance, he reverted to his, his real stuff. Being spotted on camera with a girl who was reported missing began a train of events which has left Jesse Matthew in a cell for the rest of his life. I've actually measured it out in my home, uh, just how small a space he has. And for a man his size, he could take two and a quarter steps large steps, but that's all. I think the walls are concrete. It must be miserable. I say it's no different than if there was a rampaging bear in our neighborhood. People are not safe with the bear in the neighborhood. People are not safe with Jesse Matthews free and loose in the world. And he will never be that again.